right? So in the last presentation, we mostly talked about, well, except for the discussion part, we talked about the positives that could come from autonomous systems. But in this case, we really have to concentrate on the negatives if we're talking about autonomous weapons. So ever since uh, humankind has existed, we've always had the need to protect ourselves. And for some people, they've always felt the need to be able to attack. So ever since, this, uh, since cavemen and the Neanderthals, they've relied on their own hands and feet or, and their heads to be able to do such a thing. Then we slowly transitioned to using rocks as weapons. And with further technology, we went to swords. And then with the discovery of gunpowder, we went to muskets, guns, and cannons. And probably the last true revol revolution of weapons that we had so far would be, uh, of course, nuclear weapons. And in that case, um, we truly reached the maximum that we could achieve with uh, impact with one weapon. But now, if we're talking about autonomous weapons and robots especially, we're truly, uh, we can achieve a weapon that can concentrate on truly one target and can uh, reach uh, any sort of uh, location imaginable. And this revolution is just starting, so we truly don't know the true impacts of this yet. But if we look at the development of such robots, this is the Atlas robot developed by Boston Dynamics. And this is the version from 2016. And as you can see, it's, it can kind of fight off the humans a little bit and some impact. But, you know, the reaction time is rather slow. So we still have a long ways to go, especially if you, get, if you look right here. I mean, it's probably going to take a while before we can play hide and seek or hockey with them or whatever. But uh, there's one specific sequence that I'm waiting for. Yeah, this one. So, you know, it's back in 2016, this robot had so much trouble balancing. And now, if you look at the version from 2017, I mean, we already saw this video last week. You can see how it's jumping, doing backflips eventually. And if you just think about the sort of development that we've managed to achieve in one year, could you imagine what we'll see in 20, 50, maybe 100 years? A perfect landing, maybe. All right. So if you look at the state of technology today, there are already some uh, autonomous weapons. So for example, if you look at the automatic sniper stations that are positioned at the demetrialized uh, military zone between North and South Korea, um, these sniper stations are capable of identifying human targets, and they're uh, capable of firing at targets up to one kilometer away. And the main thing to take away from that is that they can, they can fire automatically without any human intervention. Of course, right now, they still do rely on some sort of feedback from humans. But the question is, will we get to a point where they can fire autonomously from an ethical standpoint? Of course, the technical uh, aspect is already present. As you can see with the MDA's fire and forget brimstone missiles, they can be fired. And at that point, you can kind of forget about them because they have the uh, capability of tracking their target and uh, destroying it, so to say. And the uh, Ministry of Defense of the United Kingdom said, has already admitted that autonomous drones are technically feasible today. So when we talk about drones, we already uh, mostly were probably... You probably know these uh, predator drones from the U.S. government. And, but the thing, main thing about them is that right now they're usually remotely operated from a station back in Nevada. But if we look at uh, some recent developments, such as this drone being intercepted by Iran thanks to electromagnetic jamming, you really have to reconsider 
especially if you're the government and if you're investing so much money into this, you'll probably need to make them autonomous because you can, thanks to hacking and also the technological process of your enemies, you could easily change the GPS, you could hack it, and also if you're talking about the technical standpoint, you know, it's not perfect, you could lose a signal, the connections are sometimes slow, especially if you're talking about connections between two sides of the world and then you have short decision, and sometimes you need short decision times. So if, if we were to rely on humans to send a signal to actually do something, it could be too late. So the need for autonomy, if, if you're really uh, for wars and fighting or whatever, then I guess it's right here. So when we're talking about lethal autonomy, then we're talking about the ability of a machine to hunt, identify, and kill human targets based on software calculations in unscripted environments. That's a fancy definition. All right, so uh, of course there are going to be some supporters that are going to um, talk about the benefits of such autonomous systems. And the main thing in theory is that it would limit the danger for soldiers. You could save lives, theoretically, of course, because, you know, of course, if you send more autonomous weapons and robots to fight, then you could potentially kill more people than you would save. And then, of course, for the military, when we're talking about the advantages of it, then you have the um, efficiency that it can compute faster. I mean, and since we're talking about computers, they probably wouldn't slow down due to fatigue. They wouldn't feel any emotions. I mean, they wouldn't kill somebody just to kill somebody because they would, f they would be in the mood to kill somebody. And um, you could, nowadays, the main use of robots is to usually de deploy them in dangerous situations where you probably know that there's a bomb or some sort of a mine and you would send them there to blow it up to make sure that no human would actually be the one in charge of such a dangerous mission. And of course, if, you're truly care, if you care about the economic impact more than anything, then uh, the advantage of robots is obviously clear because the cost of keeping one robot in the long term is beneficial. And then uh, if we're talking about, and I think I mentioned this already, uh, when we're talking about emotions, robots wouldn't have emotions. So, and since they wouldn't have to be worried about keeping themselves alive, they probably wouldn't theoretically necessarily kill their enemy or adversary to, to protect their own lives. They could probably just like, you know, tase them or electrocute them or something like that. So in a way, that could be a potential advantage of such systems. And then, uh, yeah, judgments would not be influenced by emotions. And if you also care about the soldiers, uh, there would be no post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome or anything. So we saw the benefits and, you know, what could go wrong? We all know what could go wrong if we're talking about killer robots. We could just look at the movie Terminator and see the uprising of killer robots. So that's why we have the campaign to stop killer robots. And this is a campaign led by various scientists, non-governmental organizations to ban the, not just the use, but also the development of such systems. And if you look at the aim of the campaign, uh, the main point of the campaign is to make sure that there's always a human involved in the decision making of the robot. And then uh, when we're talking about laws and regulations, uh, they would like a pr comprehensive preemptive prohibition of the development, production, and use of fully autonomous weapons. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're talking about international treaties, national laws, and other measures. And, uh, and it would also like transparency from different nations, you, mostly the ones that are developing such systems. Because what if your government is developing a color robot? Wouldn't you like to know that? All right. So let's look further at some possible problems, starting with the arms race. 
So uh, due to the age that we're living in where technology is readily available and it's very advanced, uh, governments are pretty much very close to developing such killer robots and such weapons. So especially if we're looking at countries like the United States, China, Israel, South Korea, and Russia, and the UK, um, who knows how many years it could take before they can develop such weapons. Maybe they're already there and we don't know about it. So um, if one nation manages to achieve this status, others will probably follow, meaning that even more weapons would be made in order to make sure that uh, each country would be, able to def would be able to defend itself from such attacks, which would in turn lead to even more weapons and more weapons and further more weapons, which would also in turn make it more accessible for uh, civilians to get their hands on it if there are various companies and enterprises making these systems, which would, in theory, lead to a anonymous war, which we'll f get to in a few slides. And then um, starting with more of the ethical side of this issue, we're talking about the accountability gap. So the main question would be, who would be held responsible for actions that a robot or an autonomous system would make? Would it be the manufacturer, the software provider, the owner, or would it be the government? And if you're starting to ask who would it be, the most likely answer at this point would be no one, because unless there's some sort of a treaty or some sort of a law to truly dictate who it is, I mean, you can't blame the robot. I mean, what, what, what could you do to it? You can't send it to jail. So, all right. And now we come to the moral issues because robots, at this point at least, do not possess the ability to uh, have moral judgment. So if we're... So they would... If it was about to kill somebody, they really wouldn't understand the difference between killing somebody or maybe giving them ice cream, you know, because they simply could not compare it, at least at this point, of course. So, and if we look at the UN, I mean, the United Nations report on lethal autonomous robotics, um, for the most part, the report said, and uh, it made sure that it was clear that this technology is not available at this point, and it's very hard to see such technology being available. So the decisions over life and death in armed conflict, uh, at least according to various treaties like the Geneva Convention, uh, such decisions require compassion and intuition. So simply these weapons would not has the law that we have today. And since these machines uh, should not have the capability to decide over death and life. Now, if we look at the counter arguments from the proponents of such systems, uh, they would most likely say, well, the technology might not be available right now, but what if it is in a few years? Wouldn't it be better to have a perfect machine in quotation marks than perhaps a faulty human. Because if you look at our history of the whole world, not just one country in particular, there are always people, soldiers included, who do not obey the laws, who kill people who shouldn't be killed. They kill people out of revenge. They don't think about who they're killing. And... Um, and also, if you'll go back to the emotional aspect and the fatigue aspect, um, and also how humans try to protect their own life, wouldn't it be better to just have these robots? And if we're talking about the accountability again, then if this machine is perfect anyways, who would? what sort of accountability would there be anyways, right? So, but the counter, counter argument would be that uh, morality cannot be captured by a set of instructions, and this view has already been held since ancient Greece by Socrates. And 
And also, uh, another argument is that robots will never fight for the right reason, in quotation marks, because they will not, uh, most likely, again, understand the point of the war that they're fighting anyways. And uh, in most cases, yes, we do machines, uh, we do use machines such as, you know, bullets, missiles to fight war, but there's always a human element behind it. So it's important to make sure it stays this way. And then another problem that could arise would be that autonomous weapons would make the decision to go to war a lot easier because if you're not sending human lives, you wouldn't have to convince anybody politically that lives are being wasted unnecessarily. So if, if it just takes a few dollars to fight, I mean, look at a... I'm sure you could think of a country right now that is very aggressive in their politics and they probably don't possess these robots anyways and they're not afraid of invading other territories. Could you imagine if these countries would get this kind of technology? I can't. So this one would in turn lead to more damage done on the civilians who aren't, uh, who don't possess this technology anyways, and that would just be sad in my opinion. And you know, if uh, we reach this kind of technology, what if there's this one person who's really bored and they just decide to you know, send out their own robots for fun because in this day and age when we're playing video games, they don't tend to be exactly, um, how would I say this? Um, uh, let's say child-friendly. Anyways, um, I mentioned this before, but if we're talking about an anonymous war, uh, you could send out drones independently without anyone knowing who the attacker is. So it would be harder to defend anyways because you don't know who the attacker is in the first place. And this could be taken advantage of by smaller countries because they wouldn't rely on uh, their population. So if we're talking about a country of less than one million, all, they, all it would take is some investment into a lot of robots and they could attack their neighbor. And of course, we're talking about also criminals and terrorists. Imagine if Al-Qaeda got got a hold of such weapons. Do you think it would be good? Probably not. And also we could, um, of course, get private enterprises involved if they're really after money and if they feel like they could uh, invade a competitor in order to gain secrets or something like that. And another point would be the threat to democracy. So uh, if we have a dictator that decides to send human soldiers somewhere, there always is a chance that uh, these human soldiers could boycott the mission if they don't feel like that the true aim of the mission is for good. So in that way, there is still some democracy involved. However, robots obviously would not deny such opportunities. And if we're talking about uh, technologically advanced countries, uh, there would be a lot of, there's a lot of uh, vulnerability that comes from data. If you look at social networks, there's a lot of information about you and every other person and how everybody's involved and interlinked between each other. So if there's one specific group that you would like to target, it would be pretty easy to find and also get rid of them if you're just sending out killer robots. And yeah, in this way you could get rid of uh, enemies of the state if we're talking about, uh, you know, dictatorships such as in communism or fascism and ideas could easily be eradicated. That's why there's an open letter that has been signed by some notable people, people like Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, Noam Chomsky, that oppose uh, the use of AI to make these sort of decisions because they do see the potential in AI, but they also see the sort of trouble it could bring. So they want to make sure there's always a human element involved. And uh, such an example of AI being used nowadays is in these drones, even the ones that are um, being piloted by humans, um, the very modern 
drones have about 65 cameras. And I don't know if you can, but I certainly cannot uh, keep track of all the visuals and videos that would be coming through 65 different cameras. And that's why AI would be used uh, to keep track of everything and look out for uh, different targets. So in this way, AI would probably tell us, and the pilot especially, who to concentrate on, and that's, that would be just the first step. All right, so now we come to a possible solution. And, for example, as I mentioned before, international treaty would be one way to solve this problem. For example, if you look at the U.S. Department of Defense, they've already had uh, a directive that makes sure that um, only weapons that are used by, um, where the humans have the final decision are used, and uh, it makes sure that these weapons have safeties, anti-temper mechanisms, and information assurance, human and machine interfaces and controls, and above all, that it has to operate consistent with commander and operator intentions, and if unable to do so, terminate engagement or seek additional human operator input before continuing the engagement. And if such weapons and the systems fail uh, to pass this requirement, the Pentagon has said that they will simply not use it and they will not buy this technology. So, and considering the fact that the U.S. spends annually about $600 billion, there's a lot of money to be made um, not just by the current tech, uh, producers of weapons technology, but also the potential ones of these autonomous systems. And that's why we need a long-term commitment because this directive was only temporary and we need it to be long-term. And we also need to come from all different countries because, for example, the UK government believes that there is already enough legislation in place to make sure that such a problem would not arise. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like there is always room for improvement because I don't think there is enough legislation. And uh, the big, big issue when it comes to legislation would be small versus big countries because big countries that are close to getting this sort of technology would most likely be against some sort of legislation, while small countries that have probably no chance of getting this technology would be very likely to propose this legislation and not oppose it. So there would have to be a lot of discussions. And it's important to think also of the civilians, not just governments. If you look at, if you go into any technology store nowadays, you can find drones that you can op operate and some that can also fly on their own. They're able to track humans and um, you could Think of the potential impact if you just added a weapon to it. And another potential solution would be to make sure that there's no privacy for robots or other autonomous vehicles or drones or these systems in general. And one way to do it would be to make sure that they have an ID sort of similar to how cars have license plates at the end and the front. So you would always know who it belongs to and also, in this case, it would be important to develop some sort of a application where it would be readily available for you to check who it belongs to and if this drone truly is licensed or not. And if you find that it isn't, that you could um, call the police and have them take care of the drone. So, yeah. And uh, if you're still not convinced uh, one of the main likely objections to banning killer robots would be they will be better at killing, which I don't know. I feel like that's the point of the legislation anyways because we do not want to kill more people. At least I don't. And, uh, and if we think about evolution, if one weapon, if, if a new type of weapon becomes available, it's only a matter of time before it gets into the hands of many other people and before... It, uh, it's developed further. So in this case, I think it's important to make uh, to take care of this issue now when we still have the chance. And robots will be more ethical at killing, will follow rules of war, more likely to distinguish between civilian and combatant. 
Uh, nowadays, it's easy to strike this down as a naive belief before, because we're still far away from that. But especially because the complex vision systems that such robots would need to have in order to uh, distinguish between a criminal or a civilian, a, a grandma or a terrorist, it's, it's decades away. And also, any uh, technology can be hacked, as mentioned before. So, so if terrorists got their hands on it, they could make sure that this robot would not uh, be very ethical. And then robots can simply fight robots. Um, at this point, there isn't a designated battlefield part of this world yet, so it's hard to say, like, where would you have them fight? Maybe in space, but we're still far away from that. And uh, killer robots already exist. Yes, but right now it's mostly as uh, defensive systems, so there are some warships that they have it as protection, but the key here is that it's defensive, and the main point of the legislation is would be to ban offensive killer robots. And weapon bans don't work. Uh, that's simply not true. If you look at uh, various treaties that the UN has passed, such as in uh, 1990 and 1997 when they banned blinding lasers and anti-personnel mines, uh, nowadays if you would go to any war zones, you would not see these uh, weapons available because they aren't produced, it's illegal to produce them, so it's impossible to get a hold of them. And, and the main point would be that uh, simply we would prevent arm races and make sure that these weapons are not available. And yeah, that's about it for me. There's, these are the sources I used. And does anybody have any questions? <laughs>